Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Perryman. I'm the Director of Strategic and Historical Studies at the Sea Power Centre Australia, and it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you here today for our King Hall History Conference 2019. Maritime Warfare in the Indo-Pacific, Lessons for the 21st Century. There's just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, as I'm sure you'll appreciate an event like this, we're actually situated in the Parkside Ballroom. In the event of an emergency, we will take the direction from ICC Sydney Wardens, of which there are three dedicated to this level, plus a security officer. Uh, the ICC Sydney Chief Warden will direct all delegates to the nearest and safest assembly point, should that be required, and if necessary, we'll be told to remain in place. So, the conference. If you'd have been in Sydney 106 years ago, the place would have been a buzz. And the reason that it would have been a buzz was because the Royal Australian Navy Fleet Unit had arrived. And there was a tumultuous turnout for that event. Arguably one of the biggest that Sydney had seen uh, in its short history. Within that fleet were the destroyers Parramatta, Yarra and Warrigo, each of which proudly carried Aboriginal names of prominent rivers. Those names are now proudly etched in the annals of the Australian Navy and they have enjoyed several iterations. This was an early acknowledgement of Australia's first people and in keeping with that spirit, it serves as a very fitting way for me to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia. And Defence recognises their continuing connection to traditional lands and waters and would like to pay respect to their elders, both past and present. Defence would also like to pay respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women who have contributed to the defence of Australia in times of peace and war. Now, to kick off proceedings today, our keynote speaker is Professor Geoffrey Till, a former US, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, a former Dean of Academic Studies at the United Kingdom's Command and Staff College and Head of the Defence Studies Department of King's College London. Geoffrey is now the Emeritus Professor of Maritime Studies of King's College London and Chairman of the Corbett Centre for Maritime Policy. Professor Till is currently at the United States Navy War College, and please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Right, thank you. Morning everyone, and congratulations too on getting through that line, which I think is quite something. Well, this is a history conference. And what I've been asked to talk about really is maritime operations of the 20th century. So what for the 21st century? Now rightly or wrongly, the perennial question asked of historians is usually along the lines of what good do you do? And or how does what you discover help us these days? A probing set of questions sometimes followed up by the suggestion that there are more useful things to be done like business studies, accountancy, navigation, the law, engineering, brain surgery, wh whatever. The default position adopted by many such sceptics is to assume that the real answers to such questions in order are not much and yes. Accordingly, 20th century experience, it is said, um, was so different from what we face today that it's unrealistic to expect it to provide um, real lessons and yes, probably, there are more useful things to be done. Such sentiments are also indirectly backed up by purists in the historical profession who say it's an improper set of questions anyway. Historical events are so individually unique, we shouldn't expect them to generate lessons. And if we do history, uh, we should do it for its own sake, not in the expectation that it will help us cope with the present or the future. It may help us to understand how we got to where we are, but we certainly shouldn't expect it to help us decide where to go next. Uh, this default position is a lot stronger than we might care to admit. Today's world is very different from most of the 20th century, and so what happened then might not seem particularly relevant now 
The shift in military technology seemed particularly striking. In the Second war, World War, computer technology was just starting. But these days, an MP3 has more computing power than a room-sized Bletchley bomb. And now we're only just scoping the impact of big data, artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth. And this will increase the gap still further. I don't need to labour. This is an obvious point. Equally obvious is a drastic shift in the nature of the general world situation, which is much more interconnected and globalised in good ways and bad ways uh, than it was then. Even if we are returning to a world of great power conflict, it won't be the same. The international scene is no longer just an arena in which nations joust in an unending struggle for influence, power and resources, for who gets what, when and how. Now, organised transnational crime in its many forms have joined in, as have any number of terrorist groups, big multinational corporations, blind and impersonal forces like climate change, and even active citizens empowered by pervasive social media, now all potentially transformative actors in the international scene. Wars too have changed. Now they're much more wars of choice rather than of existential necessity. Accordingly, they're limited in comparison with what they could be technologically and conditional on uncertain and often wavering public support. Furthermore, the current focus on the so-called grey zone operations associated with Russia's General Gerasimov obscures the difference between peace and war. Many now expect conflicts to be conducted in the uneasy shadow lands between peace and war, where conventional kinetic operations between the military forces of recognised states are but a part, and not necessarily the major part, of the attempt to secure objectives. I'm not saying that these ideas are particularly new, nor for that matter, particularly Russian. Nor am I saying that modern conflicts will bear no resemblance to what went before. But I do think we have to agree they're likely to be substantially different and substantially more complex. Added together, all these forces have changed in the international environment make for a world so different from that of the world of just a couple of generations ago as to raise very serious doubts about the apparent relevance of previous experience of maritime operations to those of today and still less of tomorrow. In particular, it all seems to suggest that formal battlefleet engagements will be much less prominent in the current century than they were in the last and hence the value of studying them rather less of an operational imperative. So that's the case against. And yet, all the same, I think we can still draw out some abiding truths at least. So let's start at the very highest level with considerations of power and presence and the manner in which it is held, handled at sea. Vegetius. Si vis pacem para bellum, after all. If you want peace, prepare for war. Two responses seem possible. The first is simply to extend on what the great man said by making the point that it is the very existence of potentially countervailing and credible battle fleets that makes their contention less likely, simply as a consequence of the likely costs. Normal business, then, may continue from one century to the next. Building on this, a second response underlines the importance of getting such strategies of deterrence right. The 20th century offers much experience that is both relevant and useful. The division of Europe into two armed camps in 1914 precipitated war rather than peace because the military systems that resulted, if mainly on land, developed imperatives on, of their own. And the statesmen concerned on all sides lost control of their instruments of policy. 
policy became dominated by the means rather than by the ends. There were many who worried that in the Cold War, technological error or operational accident could have the same effect. And this nearly came to pass in 1962, were it not for that truly heroic captain of a Soviet submarine who decided he would not fire a nuclear torpedo at the US warships that were harassing him off Cuba. Maybe another close call came in the early 1980s when a panicky Soviet general staff seriously wondered whether NATO's able archer exercise was the real thing and that the West was about to make a preemptive strike. In both cases, fortunately, calmer councils and effective control mechanisms prevailed. And these examples seem to me to underline the importance, not just of having the military power necessary to deter, but being able to operate it effectively as a means to that end, rather than precipitate the very conflict it's intended to prevent. Such dramas today are played out daily, if usually at the tactical rather than the operational strategic levels. They are, for example, in the Gulf, when the commander of a warship is menaced by a swarm of combatants operated by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Navy, or by the antics of an opposing fishing boat, warship, or aircraft in the South China Sea, or the Baltic, all of which call for a difficult mixture of resolve and restraint. Resolve to deter, restraint to avoid dangerous provocations. And it is a balance between these two, because the 20th century provides several glaring examples of the results of getting things wrong the other way round. Both Germany and Japan in 1939 and 1941, and perhaps Argentina's General Gautieri in 1982, took the absence of credible and countervailing force in the key operational theatre as evidence of an absence of an adversary with either the will or the capability to deter, thereby precipitating disastrous conflicts through impetuous action. Assessing the level of force and the way it should be used that deters effectively while stopping short of provoking a possible adversary was and remains a key skill of the diplomat and the maritime commander. When training up captains of warships about to go into the Gulf or the South China Sea, it's hard to believe that the tactical experience of their predecessors in similar situations is without value. At a higher level, the same can surely be said for their superior commanders and political leaders in deciding how much is enough for deterrence and how much is too much. The 20th century offers a quarry of data that should help us to understand the problem and encourage more informed reflection on what to do about it. Then, as now, moreover, effective deterrence was never a matter simply of having and effectively employing military forces. Statesmen employed diplomatic and economic pressure and engaged in what we would now call lawfare, as they did over the imposition of blockade, especially in the First World War, and even the conduct of particular battles, such as the Battle of the River Plate in 1939 or Norway in 1940. They also applied the black arts of subversion and propaganda. They realised, too, the criticality of industrial support in that the economy really was the fourth arm of defence, as the UK Treasury justifiably argued in the 1930s. Around the time of the Battle of Guadalcanal, thoughtful Japanese realised with justice uh, that when American industrial might was capable of building warships faster than they could sink them, then the war was lost. That battle, really, campaign, can be seen in modern terminology as completely multi-domain in the way that land, sea and air effects were tightly and consciously uh, interwoven. <laughs>
The trick then was to be able to integrate all these lines of development into a synergistic whole, to break down the silos so that military forces and what they either threatened to do or actually did do becomes just one part of the process, albeit often a critical one, especially in war. Sometimes, though, the risks and the costs of war meant it was better to keep those forces back in reserve and mainly to employ other means of securing objectives. There really is nothing new about the so-called Gerasimov doctrine. This comprehensive approach requires what a former chief of navy recently called a national enterprise, which encourages a truly whole of society approach to the business of deterring wars and fighting them when necessary. This approach, likewise, would seem to implicitly recognise the salience of previous experience in attempting to do the same through the 20th century. However, this is all very well when dealing with existential threats by conventional forces, when the ordinary citizen can see what's at stake and so accepts the sacrifices in blood and treasure that may have to be made. But this all becomes much more difficult in situations where interests are at stake rather than survival, and where faceless adversaries like these uh, Chinese fishermen, uh, in quotes, um, operate covertly. In such circumstances, deterrence simply becomes much more complicated. It calls, if you like, for a truly comprehensive approach in which all of those angles are interwoven uh, into the same uh, kind of rope, as, as, as NATO would rather put, put it. 20th century experience shows that problems like this are not in themselves new, but their scale probably is. In preparing for and hopefully deterring conflict, it has always been necessary to get all your ducks in a row. Nowadays, there are simply more ducks. But by no means does that mean that previous experience in duck herding uh, becomes irrelevant. Once the fighting begins, however, I would argue that the basic principles enunciated by the likes of Mahan and Corbett still apply, albeit the changing circumstances might make their appearance and their application look different. All too often these days, we confuse the issue by rechristening ancient precepts, thus sea denial becomes anti-access area denial, A to AD, which might seem impressive as a sticker on a Beltway Bandit's car bumper, but I'm not at all sure it advances understanding and worry that what it is actually denying us access to is previous experience. So if the basic principles still stand, let's go down a level or two and look at the 20th century experience of victory and defeat in battle from two different but related angles. The two are the management of risk and related problems in what is these days called situational awareness of having useful insights into how things are on the other side of the hill. Uncertainty, false conclusions and unwise courses of actions are the basic stuff of war. After all, nearly half of the protagonists in wars, the losers, uh, evidently got it basically wrong. Today, as I've just said, there are many more, so many more variables in the equation, so many more things about which we can be critically mistaken. Maybe looking at previous examples in dealing with uncertainty in the management of risk will help us understand the problem more and maybe avoid some of the uh, dangers. So how should we compare Admiral Scheer's approach in 1916 to the problem of dealing with a probable probably superior adversary, at a time when much of the necessary data for decision was unavailable, with, say, Admiral Tom Phillips foray against the Japanese off Malaya in 1941. Of course, Scheer didn't know that the British battle cruisers at Jutland had critical faults in design and ammunition handling, but he did know he would probably face a larger and stronger force. Accordingly, he managed risk. 
in the calm and secure waters of the Baltic, he practiced the famous battle about Turn, the Gefet Kehrtwendung, which twice got him out of trouble in the Battle of Jutland. More interesting, though, is why he turned back on himself after the first turn and headed back towards the British and the prospect of certain defeat. Was it because he was trying to inflict another blow on the British? In which case, why did he turn away the first time? Or was it because he had mistaken the, the British position, was trying to get behind it and away home? Or was it something else? His memoirs are notably Delphic on the matter. Jellicoe was also faced with enormous uncertainties. I wish someone would tell me who is firing and what they're firing at, he famously asked, when trying to work out how best to face the approaching German battle fleet. In addition to the tactical and operational risks of getting this decision wrong, he was acutely aware of the probable strategic consequence of getting things wrong as the only man who could lose the war in an afternoon. Fortunately, he made what most agree was the right decision. But subsequently, his tactical caution, that is, a lower willingness to take risk in the battle, was criticised by those who advocated his taking a greater level of risk for the greater prize of inflicting a decisive defeat on the German fleet, defeat on the German fleet. But would sinking a few more German ships, in fact, have made all that much strategic difference? Discuss. So would the likely effect justify the extra risk? Discuss. Further, how might better dissemination of battle information around the Grand Fleet have affected things? Discuss again. What is worth remembering, though, is the downward trajectory in the inherent ability to know what's going on between, say, Trafalgar and Jutland. In 1805, the two fleets comprising 71 vessels slowly approached each other in light breezes and perfect visibility at three to four knots with each side able to appreciate the terrible beauty of the scene for several hours. By contrast, in 1916, 260 opposing warships were milling about, potentially closing at 40 knots around a much bigger area in, in different, often very limited visibility, not actually knowing exactly where they were, let alone what their position was relative to the enemy. And of course, Arguably, the decisive part of the battle took place in total darkness anyway. Compare this with Admiral Phillips in December 1941, facing a probable adverse correlation of force against the Japanese, much earlier and much greater than anyone had predicted beforehand. What level of risk should he have been prepared to manage? Critics all with the comfortable advantages of hindsight, argue that he willfully disregarded the probable data on Japanese air strength and took an unjustifiable level of risk in his foray north. Of course, we don't know, but probably he concluded that the strategic rewards for maintaining British sea control in the Gulf of Thailand justified what he knew was a high level of risk. Maybe he suspected that the fate of Malaya and Singapore depended on it. And he was quite right in the end. <clears throat> For Churchill, the risks were at a different and higher level. If the Malay Peninsula, he said, had been starved for the sake of Libya and Russia, no one is more responsible than I, and I would do it again. After all, between a third and a quarter of the tanks defending Moscow that winter were British Valentines. And who knows what the strategic consequences would have been if they and the 600 aircraft that might otherwise have gone to Singapore had not been there. So why then did he send out the Prince of Wales and the Repulse? Too valuable as just a token of commitment, too weak as a deterrent. Maybe because he seriously underestimated the Japanese propensity to take risk. He didn't expect a Japanese attack this early during the monsoon season. Or maybe, contrary argument, it was a lure for the Americans. 
a British sprat to catch the American mackerel. In a clear bid to reduce British risk, the first thing that Phillips did when he arrived in theatre was to fly to Manila to talk to America's Admiral to Tommy Hart about joining up their forces. In all these situations, it's clear that decision makers had incomplete command of the necessary facts for rational decision. They did not know what they needed to know for truly informed decision making. The point of all this is not to decide who was right and who was wrong in all these battles. This is fascinating, even fun, uh, but it's not the point, or at least not this point. Nor is it to evolve a set of rules about how risk should be assessed and responded to, because although that sounds a very good idea, if you can actually do it, instead it's more an attempt simply to understand the problem, really to qualify clarify what the fog of war actually means and perhaps to reinforce some commonplace points such as the importance of gathering as much battle information as you can and disseminating it to those who need it when they need it. These days the prospect of denial of service cyber attacks such as the one that Peter Singer has suggested that the Chinese would attempt against the US Pacific Fleet in the early stages of the next major war, suggests this question has a special salience. It makes exercises in which there is totally inadequate information on which to act particularly valuable. How would we manage if we had to go back to flags and morphs, uh, metaphorically or even literally? And this gets me to my final point, you'll be glad to hear. One of the things that really comes out loud and clear from a survey of maritime operations in the 20th century as the basis for preparing for those in the current one is perhaps the need to prepare people and institutions for the simple fact of strategic surprise. Of course we should do everything possible to reduce the prospects of being caught by surprise in the first place by deep study, trend analysis, surprise and no surprise futures and all the other aspects of futurology. That we don't just focus on the pressing problems of the present but do what we can to know what's coming down a few more years down the line. But at least as important must be the conscious effort to build as much institutional flexibility in organisations an intellectual agility in people, partly through expansive, imaginative and challenging professional military education as we can, in order to be able better to cope with the probability, perhaps the near certainty, of being caught completely by surprise when the time comes. And in this I hope I confirm that for all the novelties of the present and the uncertainties of the future, history has a good deal to offer, both as a quarry of processed experience and as training in fast reactive analysis that makes the best use of the evidence available when it's available. I'm not advocating trying to drive a car down the street by staring out of the back window. But I am saying that an effective driver moving forwards looks in the rear view mirror from time to time. And as an academic who just passed the Rhode Island driving test, I was reminded of this uh, last week. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you, John. Please have a seat. Well, thank you very much indeed, Geoffrey. That was a, a most illuminating uh, uh, presentation and I can't believe how much you uh, actually covered in such a short period of time. We've now got time for our, our questions and answers session uh, and as advised uh, these are being submitted through the applications and through Twitter. So Geoffrey the first question that I have for you uh, is you mentioned that uh, future wars will be wars of choice rather than wars of existential necessity. Are fights for self-determination which are currently taking place not driven 
by existential necessity? Um, yes, they are for one side, but not necessarily for the second. But the problem was that, you know, if you look at something like the American war in Vietnam, there was much more at stake in that war for the Vietnamese than there was in the United States. And it was for that very reason that one of the problems that the Americans faced in conducting that war was the maintenance of public support. Mm. Because at one stage of the game, fairly early on actually, uh, people began quite genuinely to ask uh, what was in it for the United States, what made it worthwhile, all that sacrifice and loss of treasure. And it's the asymmetry, if you like, between conceptions of what's at stake that can be a problem in situations like that. If you're looking at something like, um, let's say, uh, the current situation between the Ukraine and Russia over the access to the Sea of Azov, I'd say that both situations, um, both com combatants, if you like to call them that, in, in that situation, have to some extent the same problem. Um, they both sense that the interest that they have at stake is really important, particularly the Ukrainian. Um, but the Russians too, because one of the issues that Mr. Putin is obviously clearly concerned about is the survival of the regime. And so a major foreign policy defeat would have very adverse consequences for him personally. But comparing that with something like the Second World War, um, it does seem to be radically very different and that the limitations um, on what might be done will reflect that fact. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, could you please reflect on the role that luck has in warfare? Hmm. Uh, can we hope to even partially control our destiny? <laughs> That's an extremely good question that has um, baffled analysts for several hundred years. Um, the, the, one of the stock answers is that you get the luck you deserve. Mm. Uh, that effectively, if you um, make all your preparations in as professional way as you can, if you do all the right things that people like Clausewitz, Mahan and Corbett and all the rest of them have actually recommended that you do, you're in a better position um, to withstand adverse consequences of luck. So you can make your own luck? Up to, a, up to a point. But there is no doubt that, that luck does play a part. I, I always think in, in this sort of circumstance of, of Admiral Phillips. Um, after all, he did survive the first big uh, survey, um, uh, surveillance mission that the um, Japanese Navy did, and the second. And it was only when one plane happened to turn back and have another check that, that he was actually detected or Quantan. Bad luck mm -hmm. or a question of very high levels of training and commitment by the Japanese one. The argument's wide open. Okay. The next question uh, which we've received on our feed is, uh, what is the role of the Navy with respect to diplomacy in a modern war of choice? I think it's not, the s not any different from it's always been that effectively naval manoeuvres, uh, naval conflict in the course when after the firing has started, are all intended to transmit messages. They're transmitting messages, the same messages I was talking about in, 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 in my talk of resolve, and maybe in peacetime at any rate, restraint. Mm. And that effectively uh, we should regard battles effectively as militant diplomacy and I think one of the West's problems is this tendency to bifurcate the two peace and war much too strongly and to assume that somehow or other once the fighting starts then we leave it to the generals to get on with the professional business of fighting the war it's not that simple because what they do has significant political consequence and it might well be that they're deeply irritated by the fact that their plans and preparations have to conform to what their political masters say is the broad political objective. But they should recall that that's what they're seeking to be instruments for anyway. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of this first session. Uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking 
Professor Till for his uh, opening keynote address and we'll now go to a short break.